couple of months ago, The Onion ran a story on a Buddhist fundamentalist sect called the Gamatana sect. And I'd like to know where they found out about the Gamatana sect. Releasing a typical fundamentalist video, but it wasn't typical at all. It was a fundamentalist sect saying they were going to release waves of peace and harmony across the world as a threat. And of course the TSA said they were going to do everything they could to prevent that. And it makes you stop and think. When you hear the word fundamentalist, it usually has a bad connotation. People are very narrow-minded, willing to kill other people for their views. They don't agree with them. But if the fundamentals are good, then fundamentalism isn't bad. In the Buddhist teaching, the fundamentals are very good. And that's why it's good to stick with them. The Buddha himself said that he didn't approve of any changes in his dharma, that he'd learned a skill and he wanted to pass that skill on. And he did everything he could to make sure it was passed on intact, because he not only left a body of teachings, he left an order of monastics trained to question one another on the meanings of the teachings, to practice them. So the meaning of the teachings was clear, and that could be passed on from generation to generation. In fact, one of the fundamentals of Buddhism is that if you associate with good people, you'll benefit. The more experienced the people they are in terms of generosity, virtue, conviction, and discernment, particularly discernment into how to put an end to suffering, the more you benefit. Because what it comes down to is the Buddha's realization is that the big problem in life is the suffering we cause. And we don't have to. And why do we cause that suffering? It's not because we're innately good or innately bad. It's because we're ignorant. Well, the Buddha's word, awichak, also means unskilled. It's our lack of skill in how we act and think and speak that creates that suffering. But we can master skills that put an end to that suffering. And in mastering those skills, we're not depending on the fact that we're innately good. Because the Buddha doesn't say that either. His basic principle is that the mind is capable of anything, and it's very quick to change. In fact, it's so quick that he said he couldn't find an analogy that was appropriate. And here he was, a master of analogies, and he, this is where he was left, not knowing what to say. The mind can change itself so fast. So what we've got to do is learn how to change the mind in a good direction and keep it in the good direction. That requires mindfulness, requires alertness, it requires ardency. All the qualities we're working on as we meditate. And what's our motivation? The heedfulness. The realization that our actions really do shape our lives, shape our experience of pleasure and pain. So we've got to be very, very careful. So the fundamentals all keep coming back to us and our minds, and how the mind needs to be trained, and how it can be trained, and how we can do it. That's the important part. If we were innately bad, we wouldn't be able to do anything. We'd be stuck in our badness, and we'd have to have outside help. If we were innately good, well, we wouldn't be where we are right now, that's for sure. So we have to depend on our heedfulness. That's another good fundamental. It's our desire for happiness that keeps us going, and our desire for the happiness to be true is what develops the qualities of the Buddha himself exemplified. Discernment, as he said, starts with the realization that 
your happiness depends on your actions, and that long term is better than short term. That question, he said, that lies at the basis of discernment. What, when I do it, will lead to my long term welfare and happiness? That's an important question to keep in mind all the time, because it takes us through all the levels of the practice, even when we get to the teachings on not self. When the, when the category of I or my in that first question finally gets dropped, it's because it's for the sake of genuine happiness that we do that. And based on this discernment, then comes the question of compassion. We know the story of King Basenity and Queen Malika, where one evening where just the two of them are together in the, the royal apartments, and the king turns to the queen and says, Is there anyone you love more than yourself? And of course, being a king, he's hoping that she'll say, Yes, Your Majesty, you. But even a king can't get that out of his queen. And she said, No, there's nobody I love more than myself. How about you? And he had to admit, well, No, that it was true. End of scene. The king goes down to see the Buddha. And the Buddha affirms what Queen Malika said, and then he draws an interesting conclusion. You could search the whole world, he said, and not find anybody that you love more than yourself. But at the same time, you have to realize that everybody you'd meet loves themselves more than they love anybody else. What conclusion does he draw from that? It's not that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. He says, realizing this, you should never harm anybody or cause anybody to do harm. In other words, if your happiness depends on harming them, it's not going to last. So an important part of wisdom is developing compassion, taking other people's happiness into consideration. But how far can you do that? I was reading recently someone saying that Buddhism is going to have to change, that nirvana is no longer good enough for us, it no longer meets our needs. We need a more compassionate teaching that straightens out the world first before we all, all go off to nirvana. Well, one of the problems of the world, of course, is everybody's trying to straighten everybody else out. The Buddha's realization is, is we have to straighten ourselves out. And this is where that issue of skill and lack of skill comes in. And there's no way you can force anybody else to practice. The Buddha himself never tried to force anybody. Someone once came to him and asked if all the world was going to go to awakening, or half the world, or a third. And the Buddha didn't answer. Ananda was sitting by, was concerned that the person might get upset that the Buddha didn't answer his question. So he took him aside, and he gave an analogy. He said, it's like a royal fortress, and the gatekeeper, who's wise, walks around the fortress. The fortress has one gate, and he's, he's walking around. He sees that aside from the gate, there's not a hole large enough in the wall even for a cat to slip through, much less a person. And so what does the gatekeeper know? He doesn't know how many people are going to go in and out of the fortress, but he does know whoever goes in and out of the fortress is going to have to go in and out the gate. In the same way, the Buddha knows that whoever's going to go to awaken is going to have to develop the path, abandon the five hindrances, and develop the factors for awakening, follow the Eightfold Path. But it's going to be up to each individual to decide to do that or not. So the kindest thing you can do is, one, follow the path, because that's one of the ways that we keep the Dharma alive, is by sticking to the path. And then if you have the ability, you teach it to others who are willing to hear and are willing to try it. That's the kindest thing you can do So this idea that nirvana somehow is irresponsible or going to nirvana is irresponsible. It's a total misunderstanding, because it's not like you can just slip off someplace and disappear. The path requires generosity. The path requires compassion, and a quality that the Buddha called purity, in which you look at your actions. Do they really lead to long-term happiness? Are they really harmless? Do they really embody compassion? It 
before you act, ask yourself these questions. Is this action I'm going to do going to cause any harm, either to me or to some, anyone else? If you see that it's going to cause harm, you don't do it. If while you're doing the action you find that it's causing harm, you stop. Once you've done, you ask the questions again, did this cause any harm? And if you realize that it didn't look like it was going to cause harm and you didn't see any harm when you did it, but after it was done you realize that it did cause harm. You resolve not to repeat it, and you go talk with someone who's further advanced in the path. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha set up the Sangha. This is one of the reasons why friendship with noble people is an important part of the practice. So we don't have to keep reinventing the Dharma wheel for ourselves. If you don't see any harm either before, during, or after the action, then you can take pride and joy in the fact that you're developing on the path. Notice the Buddha here is not saying don't make mistakes. He's saying try not to make mistakes, but be willing to admit the mistake after it's done. And don't be afraid to see your mistakes. I know in my time with the John Fuang, I got called on issues I had never been called on in my life before, criticized very heavily for little tiny things. And at first my feelings were hurt, but then I realized, wait a minute, he's not doing this to hurt my feelings, he's doing it to teach me, to show me what's right and what's wrong so I can improve. Because again, he can't just pour the knowledge into my head. It's a skill that I had to learn. And so one of the skills that you've got to learn is how to take criticism, not get blown away by it, not get discouraged by it. see where you've made a mistake, resolve not to repeat it, and then stick with the path. So these are some, some of the fundamentals in Buddhist fundamentalism. And they're all good fundamentals. Which is why in this one area, unlike a lot of other areas in the world. There's nothing wrong with being a fundamentalist. In fact, that's how we do the best we can for the world. We straighten ourselves out in thought, word, and deed. Set a good example for others. Share our knowledge when we can. And stop causing suffering both for ourselves and for all other beings. This, the Buddha said, is one of the greatest gifts you can give, if not the greatest.